I was going to remind you. A little bit low. Okay. Okay. I turned it down earlier. So I just... okay. And here's the agenda for tonight. Actually, I'm not sure that Stephen has joined us yet. If he doesn't present, maybe Chad will jump in and tell us what's going on in his garden. Maybe Nicole will do that. Yeah, I remember. All okay, right. So, so um, let's start with um, let's start with the questions. The first question up was from someone who's not here yet. Hmm. Gail isn't here yet. But this is, but this is an important question. She says she's not here all summer. That's typical for her. Of course, this year is a little bit different. Is there someone around the community, or, or maybe we could start a service going for people who are going to be away, to have like help gardening while they're away? Uh, anybody got ideas about this? Well, I'll just jump in. Um... We're actually away right now, and my neighbor is watering my garden. Am I echoing? Yes. Yeah, phone's on or something? Hang on. Just um, one more thing here. All right. All right. No, you have a reverberator. <laughs> All right, is that better? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, but that's the same issue that I have. So I've been thinking about other people that are in the community that may be able to help and we can help each other while we're away. And I luckily had a neighbor that was willing to come over and weed and um, water and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's a, it's a big issue and maybe we can do something within the community to try and help each other. Any other thoughts? Someone is there, yeah. Well, maybe there's a people know gardeners or uh, landscapers they've worked with that ten gardens. Yeah, I think this could be a really big thing. Like a lot of people either want someone to tend their garden, or someone who has a lot of land who's not really interested in gardening who would want to lend their land to someone who would be interested in the gardening. Because I do know a few people who have land and, you know, don't have the time or. Garden. Uh, it'll be interesting to really find a kind of a connecting place for them, or some type of uh, you know place like a swap where you know fill each other's needs. That, that, I think there is there would be interest in that. Obviously, now it's tricky, but I do think that would be uh, something to look at looking into, uh, looking forward. Michael, did you say the person that asked that question is away all summer? Normally, she goes to visit her son in Barcelona. I don't know if that's going to happen this summer, but right, normally she she does a lot of traveling. Right. So she would I, know to I meant Gail isn't, Gail isn't here right now is what I meant. Gail Buckland, she's been on all of the sessions up to now. And so she, she frequently travels and she's away for, you know, long periods. And so it really complicates having a garden. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone on this uh, call who sort of is looking for this kind of work who would like to you know, be, be mentioned in specific to her, or maybe, because I, I, you know, I know someone who lives not far from her, who either this person or her son either would be qualified to do it, and we could just sort of do it as a one-off thing. But if this seems like something we should be discussing publicly, saying, gee, if you've got a, something that should be gardened, but nobody to garden it, you know, let us know, and we'll try to find someone. But if we're not going to come up with people, then, you know, what do we think about that? Why don't, why don't you send out a, uh, are we on? Am I on? Yes, yes. you're on. Um, why don't we send out a call for that to the list and see if there's anybody who would be interested in doing a little garden sitting for, you know, not for two months or something, but for if it's a couple of weeks or I think that might be feasible. Hey, this is Camille. I'm, I'm wondering, are there 4-H clubs, you oh. know, or um, one of the, you know, the, the community schools that might have have horticulture courses that some of those students might like hands-on experience mm -hmm. and you might be able to aid some young people learning to garden would we trust our gardens to them that's a great idea mm -hmm. they have an agriculture program at, at the high school I think 
I think you might run into on some of those programs there has to be an adult with them. Oh, okay. So, you know, are the adults willing to take that on the summer? Mm -hmm. Also, you know, we're we talking about doing this as a community service or, uh, you know, a paid position. There's probably oh, there's Gail. people right now who, you know, may know how to garden that have been out of work for a while. So I think, you know, those are other considerations. Right. Gail, we've been discussing your question. Oh, sorry, I was a little late. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, over the years, because I'm not always in Warwick and because I, you know, I do travel a lot, but I love having a garden, I've had a very hard time to find somebody who could, I could hire um, to help look after my garden um, and certainly, you know, pay them properly. So I was thinking that maybe there could just be a list of names of people, um, not, you know, um, you know, not necessarily, you know, acknowledged by Sustainable Warwick or anybody, but just people who care about organic gardening and, you know, somebody like me could interview them and they could earn some money and I could have a garden that um, wouldn't go to, <laughs> I mean, yeah, be totally ruined by the time I came back. I think that's a great idea. Right. I think you, we have that need. And then again, I, I live in Greenwood Lake where everyone's yard is about three feet uh, long. So, right, you know, I think some people are looking for, I mean, again, you're not offering that thing, but I do know there are people who have large, large you know, larger pieces of land who are looking to have people garden them. So like, yeah. it seems to be a need for that. And what you're saying, yeah, it should, I, I bet there are a lot of people who'd be more than willing to, especially if you're offering payment, they'd be very, you know, people love gardening anyway. Yeah. That'd be, really a really attractive offer. Yeah, and also, I mean, depending on what time it is in my garden, often, you know, they could just pick vegetables and take them home too. Um, or, you know, put them in my freezer if there was something that could be frozen. But certainly, um, you know, it would be, I would benefit. I, I don't need anybody to water because um, my neighbor always enjoys doing that. But somebody who could take some responsibility. Yeah, that, that's great. I guess, no, I don't know, Craigslist? I guess, I don't know, that's not the best place. I don't know if I'm trying no. I think that's an, un, that's an untapped niche market is garden tender. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking. There's a, there's a well, website. Chad, Chad uh, could, you, could you sort of be the follow-up person on that for this project? All right, well, yeah, yeah, Orion has uh, something. What were you saying? Yeah, there's a there's a website um where people um post um yard work uh, tasks uh, taskrabbit.com. Anybody ever been there before? Hmm. And you could look, you could like uh, Gail or somebody else could uh, put up their um their job description, and then people can apply to that job. This the, the, and you can browse the people. Um, that offered to take the position on this website. Can I also add to that that to be a tasker, which is the person who performs the task on Task Rabbit, you mm -hmm. have to have a background check. So, um, so there's a lot of legitimacy to Task Rabbit as an app, um, which you can utilize for finding people to work for you, Gail. Um, right. I was just thinking. Um, what Chad and Michael had said about growing a community of organic gardeners, people involved in, um, you know, the, the, the things that we're involved in, but also the values that rather than just go to some kind of impersonal website, if this was part of the bigger plan of whatever your plan is, you know, to make, um, you know, people in Warwick um, appreciate value, you know, be supportive. I guess what I'm saying is these Monday evenings are so supportive of me as a kind of semi-beginner um, gardener. And it's wonderful when you have a community that feels supportive of each other. 
So if there was a way of like my being supportive to, of people in our community who, you know, care about gardening, care about sustainability, you know, I'd rather go to them rather than an impersonal website. And Right. No, very nice. There's one more thing I want to add to that. There's that app. I brought it up in one of our other meetings called Next Door, um, mm -hmm. where you have right. yeah. the neighborhoods that are around. I have a like a small gardening homesteaders section on there. I started like a little group. So, you know, if I don't know if you belong to it or, you know, I could put something out there, but I think there's like 19 people in the group. I'm wondering if there's somebody, because at least we know that they're local, you know, they are our neighbors. It's a little less informal because I understand what you're saying about going to like a task rabbit or something for that. But just another thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I remember getting I think I was suspicious about it, but I'm, I'm glad you went into it and did it. I like I didn't do it. I remember like someone sent something to me, and I was like, well, I don't know about this. But I'm, I'm, I'm so you're saying you're doing it, and it's legitimate. Okay. That yeah, neighbor. it looks suspicious because they can. You right. can with next door. You can become a, like a member, and then it asks you, do you want you know these pieces of paper sent to to your house, or you know you send them to all of your neighbors, and then you go online. But it is legit. You go online, and people are talking about things that are happening in our neighborhoods. So, like I don't know if anybody else had a problem with recycling this last week, but everybody's been talking about that. Anyway, different conversation. <laughs> Uh, Nikki, can, you, can Gail, you send me an invite? Gail, you're in Warwick? I'm in Warwick, okay. yeah. Um, I was also sent an invitation to Next Door, and I, it was from a friend, so I paid attention. But in Europe, um, uh, activists are identifying neighborhoods so that you can kind of know what's happening in a limited area you know, rather than dealing statewide, national, or even countywide, people are trying to connect and say, what are your needs? I'm your neighbor. And um, the, the pandemic has generated a lot of um, new ways of interacting because we obviously can't interact in traditional ways. So that's what I thought Next Door was about, just trying to accept, accept more responsibility for a very limited locale um, that is, you know, you and your neighbors and you decide how, how broad that is. And that would also tie into like, if you had abundant vegetables, you could bring them to your neighbor. Well, yeah, we're planning, Camille mentioned that, uh, I wonder about Grow Local Greenwood Lake meetings that we, uh, this summer, I'm going to try to come up with a place in, you know, on Poplar Street, a community garden, where I'm going to post some stuff that people could exchange, you know, vegetables. You know, anyone has excess tomatoes and wants some zucchini, or now we know where to go for the garlic and potato. Uh, <laughs> with Lori and Tom, they got about fifty thousand, so we uh, will go there. But uh, yeah, that's a great idea. We, we didn't have a lot of questions submitted this week. The only other questions that were submitted were actually about fruit trees. Do, do, do people have other questions this week? Don't be shy. Yeah, anyone, feel free to speak up. And even newcomers, there's no, uh, no judgment zone. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm rather curious about if anybody out there does com container planting. I oh, go. Sure. Do you? I've never yeah. actually tried it before, and I'm looking at doing some this year. If I can ever. Yeah, it's it's not it's Get not. Don't... Containers together. <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. So, so you had a question about container gar uh, planting in general, or uh... in general, I was wondering if anybody was else was interested in that particular subject. It works, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you could grow quite a lot in containers. You just you have to water them a lot, like more than you think. Yeah. You know, every day you have to water them because they they, they okay. will dry out can't skip a day as i found out one year and they all die okay. yeah you know depending especially depending where they are they, you know because they have lim they have limited soil and obviously think about what you plant there obviously don't you know plant any kind of gigantic thing in a in a container but you can grow a lot of things in containers 
but again, just you have to water them a lot. Last year we grew peppers, uh, t egg. Did we grow an, egg an eggplant? An eggplant and tomatoes in, in containers. I would have thought tomatoes needed more a deeper soil bed. No. Uh, you, can, uh, you can do them in. Yeah, you know, um, I do. I grow flowers and perennials in containers because usually we have the community garden, but this year, since it's a little dicey what's going on, I took some planters I have that I usually have seasonal items in. I put some Swiss chard and kale in them and they're doing fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I've grown tomatoes in containers before. In fact, those, those felt grow pots, mm -hmm. are you familiar with those? Those are pretty good boys. Those are a pretty good choice for um, things like tomatoes. They're big enough for a tomato, but they're lighter weight. So, I mean, I happen to have tons of big, you need big containers. I have lots of them because I've been growing things in them for years. But yeah, you can grow a lot of things in containers. Just be aware. So it's mainly just an issue of how much you water. You have to water, yeah. water it every day. Right. Okay. I, I, I've worked on a watering problem. I use commercial uh, black pots that the small trees get uh, sold in and everything. But what mm -hmm. I do, uh, I put a saucer underneath. I use a Rubbermaid garbage can and I use that as a saucer. And then I water okay. like crazy and the water that settles in there lasts like three days, four days. And I do that with peppers and, and tomatoes. Yeah, and get, get, it depends how it would grow. Do you have sub irrigation? Uh, stuff that you could do in like wicking beds, but right, that gets a little more right. complicated. Right. You know, where it kind of waters from the bottom up, but you know, then that's I've tried that a few. That that, that does work, but then again, that's a little bit more, you know, fixing stuff. And but it, it does have a good because you know that that you have the water down from the bottom and it kind of wicks up into the top. Right, of it, right. So it doesn't dry out as fast. Are you on village water or well water? Village water. I will tell you that village water, the plants aren't as robust as they are on well water. Like I have containers out and when it rains, I let them collect a lot of rainwater. In fact, sometimes I dump it into green, you know, into big old garbage cans from when we used to have those and I save it to supplement my watering because the village water, you know, it's, it's, it's treated. So they yeah. spring <clears throat> up as much. So save your water. <laughs> have you tried getting a rain barrel, Sarah? I have the item to make a rain barrel, but somebody has to figure out how to connect it into my sort of heavy duty <clears throat> down spots that I bought. So one I of the handyman projects. <laughs> Garrett's, Garrett's been trying to uh, add yeah. something. Yeah, I just have a chicken tending question, if anybody has any information. I need to know a little bit about uh, clipping wings. Hmm. Anybody? Oh, that guy Christopher Harrison isn't here this week. Yeah, right? yeah. he's the chicken uh, master. Well, Brendan, do you know anything about chickens? Brendan's on mute at the moment. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I'm just throw that name. I don't know. I see he seems pretty uh, knowledgeable from the... Oh, hi everyone. Uh, I, I worked on a chicken farm one winter, um, but I did not uh, clip any wings, so I don't have anything. Else. <laughs> I was on the Phillies Bitch uh, Farm Project up in Goshen one winter, and my job oh, was to cool. tend, tend the chickens in exchange for rent. Oh, wow. Phillies Bridge, that's the name I know. Um, actually, we can return to rain barrels again. Um, something that I think it was Bill Makovsky who's here. Um, once said to me was to be cautious of collecting uh, rain off your roof to feed your garden if you have asphalt. And we um, had our roof replaced uh, in March. And um, before we had our roof replaced, we were getting lots of particles and things from the shingles. And since we had the roof replaced, we have even more. Um, so I would be hesitant to water my food with that personally. Um, and so I've actually been wondering, um, if I were to like put
put a couple rain barrels out by my garden because our garden is pretty far. Um, you know, how many, you know, if I'm watering a six by nine plot, how many rain barrels am I going to need? And I'm okay with a ballpark estimate. Bill, what do you think? Okay. Well, I, I, my experience, I've read where it would be bad to collect off the roof if, if it is asphalt. Um, but you can still collect that water and use it on shrubs and flowers and stuff like that. So you're not eating it. Uh, in terms of collecting water in rain barrels, uh, it doesn't rain all that much. So right. you don't even need a rain barrel. All you need is something, you know, relatively low uh, if you're going to collect the water. Because over the summer, how many inches of rain are you going to get? Probably uh, four or five. And a lot of it's going to, well, four or five per month. And a lot of it's going to evaporate. And, right. and so, you know, I don't know if, if rain barrels are the right thing to use just to put out to collect the rain directly. They're usually, uh, usually you're concentrating the water in some way to fill the rain barrel. You need surface area also. You need a large surface. You know, we had an inflatable uh, baby pool or something like that. That would be a, a, a better collector because it's larger. Well, I've seen so, these I... like funnels that go onto the the rain barrels, but I, I mean, based on what you're saying, I would probably need like four of those around my little plot to really even get a decent watering. And yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you guys were saying. I, I have a, I have some experience with rain barrels and I have one that I bought actually at um, uh, a big, um, at Walmart actually, it's four feet uh, high and about two feet wide in diameter. And uh, I collect rainwater from uh, my gutter. I have a 10 by 20 inch garden plot, which is very small. Uh, but I was concerned about the asphalt collection and uh, you know the particles being sprinkled onto the lawn. So what I did is I just simply set up a, a, a sump pump, very inexpensive sump pump that you can pick up at Harbor Freight. And I set it at a certain distance from the bottom of the tank. Um, <laughs> so it wouldn't collect the particles. The particles would simply settle down. Right. So the only thing that would come out would be the, um, you know, the, the, the water without the asphalt particles. The other advantage of this is, is that it's not pressure driven from a hose that's coming from the bottom of the tank. So you're able to maintain uh, you know, when you turn the pump on, it's a switch there at the garden. Um, you're able to maintain about as much pressure as you would get from a regular garden hose. So it's, you know, it's convenient, uh, you know, uh, to use. And very, you know, once you have it set up, it's very easy to maintain. And, and uh, it's always filled with water. So anyway. That's, those are those are my thoughts on uh, using a rain barrel. Is it just the physical bits of asphalt that are the problem? I'm sorry, Garrett has a question too. But is it just the physical bits of asphalt that's a problem, or is it the other? My concern is actually more of the chemicals more than the little bits of asphalt. Mm -hmm. It leaches into the water, in other words, so it would be a problem. The other thing, if you're collecting any kind of water in in open barrels. You have to watch out for if we, right. if we don't get rain for a while. To watch out for the mosquito issue. Right. So um, that's. Yeah, hang, I got to pull out. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye, okay. Jerry. Catch, catch you in the next one. All right. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Good to bye see bye. You. Um, I have a question. The question that I have, if I could, is, what time of day is it too late to water the garden? If I'm if I'm watering at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon is that too late can I go to six what if what if temperature is above 55 degrees what temperature should I water at what temperature should I not water at does anybody know uh, generally I try to water uh, if I water in the afternoon I try not to get the leaves so wet 
uh, but I think it's okay to water the ground and water the roots at night, but I wouldn't get the full, all the foliage wet overnight because that may cause more diseases. Yeah, I always try to water early in the morning personally, and right, and you know, always try to avoid the leaves if you could. But I don't think, you know, it's not good to do, they say during the midday sun when everything's at, at the hottest, it just, you know, evaporates right away. So I would say, you know, either, either early in the morning or later at night, but right, avoid the leaves if possible. I try to never water the leaves, especially during the day. Um, on your green, your greens and spinaches and things, you'll, you'll uh, sunburn the leaves. But at, in the evening, as long as you're watering directly on the ground, I've left the uh, drip systems on all night, you know, when it's, when it's really dry out, because you're not going to get the evaporation at that time. So it's just, you can't water the leaves. That's all. I was just gonna uh, say what some something similar to what Sarah said. I invested in a drip irrigation system last year, and it was a total game changer. And honestly, it wasn't very expensive. I di I didn't think it was very expensive for the kit with all the pieces, with the T's, the connections. It was, it's a total game changer because you can put it on, you can set it on a timer. Um, you never have to worry about getting your leaves wet, you know, and, and the ground, you can always make sure, like, even if when you just go out to check the garden, you're like, Oh, you know what? I feel like things need watering. Just leave it on for 15, 20 minutes, you know, an hour, depending on what the flow is that you have, but definitely worth looking into, um, in my opinion. Oh, of course. I have, I have one. Oh, I actually had a question. I don't know if anyone else. Uh, we you guys mentioned garlic earlier. I am growing garlic. Um, this is my first time growing it as well. So, uh, when do I know when to uh, harvest it? The general rule is that when the plant is half brown that's the time to pull it out and then you post it somewhere, hang it somewhere in the shade uh, and let it dry for weeks. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I have a question about hanging it because I grow a lot of garlic, but after, you know, they don't, but after nine months or so, or six months, they really start drying out. Is there a way of hanging them or where do you, Put your garlic so that you can it stays good for as long as you have it well it's only going to stay good for six months or nine months or ten months that's really good oh. it doesn't last for a year <laughs> or for more than that because um, i always want it to last to the next crop <laughs> i know i know but it uh, yeah it doesn't usually do that um if you get certain kinds of garlic it will tell you you know stores for six months or stores for nine months or whatever so you want to get one that stores well but you want to you want to put it where it's definitely going to be dry while it, you know you want it to dry out. But then we put ours in a cool room after that. A cool room. A room in the basement, yeah. And um, and that that keeps it for quite a while. Actually, I'm just using my last two heads of garlic. It's amazing. I almost got through the year this time. Uh, so a cool a cool room is okay even if, even if it's uh, has moisture. Uh, well, ours is a basement room. It's not really, Definitely. really moist, but it's, it's, you know, it's not dry. Yeah, uh, exactly. It hangs around 50 degrees uh, over the winter, 40 to 50. Uh, and it's not really that moist. Uh, most of the stuff that we have, we, we don't store things that need a lot of moisture in there. Most of the things are squash and onions and stuff, and they, they don't need a lot of moisture. I would add that a uh, hard neck garlic goes bad a lot faster than soft neck garlic. Oh. So anything that has escape on it, uh, you should use that a little bit sooner and hang on to your soft necks for the winter. I've been storing it in a large basket so it gets air in a cooler room and we've been fine with that. I have another Thank question. I was given some garlic and I planted it in the fall. And right now the shoots are about that tall. Is that good, bad? <laughs> Where does it, is That's it a fine. fully growing? <laughs> we yeah, we put ours in, in October, I, I have to, in October, and I guess it's now 
foot and a half, two, two feet tall. And then it's going to flower, and then I can then, then wait for it to flower to done, and then it dries out, and that's when, and that's when you do it, right? We don't um, want it to flower. No we flowering. We don't want it to flower. No, we don't let it. We'll, we'll cut the scapes off. Um, the scapes come in uh, June, I guess, yeah. around yeah. mid-June, and we cut the scapes. And then when the bottom, about uh, two-thirds of the plant, I guess, starts to yellow on the bottom and brown, it's usually time to pull it. That's usually towards the end of July. Okay. Thank you. End of July. Mid-July, end of July, it's right. usually ready. Then you hang it and let it dry. And don't wash it off. Some people yeah. wash it off to get it clean. That's a no-no, just that'll get moldy. So just make sure you brush it with a brush just to get some of the excess dirt off and then just either lay it out. We one year laid it out on a large screen mm -hmm. um, in a garage or you could hang it, but for at least two, two to three weeks. Then after that, you store it. Thank you. Getting back to Peyton's question, the, the garlic that she has, if it's just breaking the surface, it's a little behind, I think. It should yeah. be bigger than that. I'm mm -hmm. not sure why it didn't get bigger, but maybe you could fertilize it some, and maybe it'll come a little later. When did, when did you plant it, Peyton? You know, I want to say it was October. It could have been later. Um, I, I don't. No, but I remember how reading. deep did you plant it? How deep? Not very deep. Because usually oh. you plant that for about six inches deep or so like that. Oh. Maybe but that's where I went wrong. It, it might it might make a late surge. You, you never know. Yeah, I mean I'll just I'll keep watching it. I've just I've just been like grow, grow, and it doesn't seem like it's really gone anywhere for the last couple of months. So would is it too late to maybe try putting like to shove it down a little bit or can you nah, heap dirt on it like I think you it's too late potatoes? Yeah. could you heap dirt on it like you heap dirt on potatoes mm, i would leave it be at this point okay thank you i have another question um i i have a friend who's got some uh sweet potatoes growing in his kitchen and I was going to take them and chop them up and toss them in the ground. Am I too late to do that, or can I get away with doing that? You don't grow sweet potatoes that way. How do you do it? Well, I've always bought the slips, you know, from a from a grower. But people who grow their own slips, they take the sweet potato in February or so and put it in water, and it starts to sprout. And those sprouts, you root those sprouts. That's what you buy from the from the supplier. And it's a it's a started plant that you plant for sweet potatoes. You don't. It's not like a potato. Okay, but his are already started. I mean, they have shoots. They shooting have the sprouts. Out. Yeah. Do they have roots? Uh, I believe they do. If oh. you have a, there you go. There we go. Sweet potato sprouts. If you roots you Michael, can say something so i can hear it you can plant them out uh, but i would wait a little bit longer maybe a couple of weeks because they're yeah. some of the right. most sensitive uh, plants uh but if they have roots you can just plant them with the root uh mm -hmm. one other thing that i do is when i put my sweet potatoes in after they grow a couple feet i clip off the ends and root them and plant them. Uh, they don't get to be quite as big as the sweet potatoes that you put in earlier, but you do get some sweet potatoes from that. So you can you can do that anytime, but not too late. And the other thing that uh, when you're when you plant them, they don't you don't want them to get wet until they get themselves settled. So you need to cover them with we have slitted plastic or some other kind of plastic so that they don't get rain on them, and you don't want to water their leaves. You know, you want to let them get set, and then they'll they'll take and they'll grow. Okay, okay. So plant them, let them root. Put a put sheet sheet plastic over them. Sl slip the sheet plastic a little bit, or something like that. Yeah, or you can just put the uh, put it on hoops, but keep it open on the ends so that it gets lots of more, uh, air going through. But right. uh, but the but the plastic will keep the rain from hitting the leaves. 
All right, so I'll have to build hoops. Or, or you know, wire hoops or something. Yeah, I, I got it. We actually started growing sweet potatoes over in the community garden about four or five years ago. And we were, you know, we build the, the big hill and everything, and we never covered them. We just planted them and they did fine. We did run into a problem a year or so ago where traditionally we put down the plastic and cut the slit and put the slip down in there for the warm the ground. Holes came in. Oh. We lost our entire crop. <laughs> so wow. Last year we did it without the plastic and we had a we had a good crop, but yeah, we've never actually covered them. So same. Yeah, that's only for the first several days until they're accustomed to it. Usually, you know, when you first put them in is when they're very sensitive to getting, right. if you had a cold, uh, rainy spell, uh, just as you were planting them, that would be bad. But okay, otherwise, no. in a few days, they're good. Yeah, okay, now I wait until it's pretty warm out to put them in. Okay, next question about them is, as, as like potatoes, will, will animals eat the leaves of the sweet potatoes or no? Yes, groundhogs, yes. Okay, so I, so I can't just use a patch that's not fenced off. How many groundhogs do you have? None right now, but, and I got two cats. And a, <laughs> and a, a slingshot, <laughs> and a slingshot. Sit out there all night. Unfortunately, my dogs played tug of war with a, uh, with a groundhog yesterday. Nice. <laughs> Are you renting your dogs, you know? No, it was horrible. <laughs> it was really, I didn't know the groundhogs could scream. Wow. We just, we just got a family of foxes that moved into the groundhog hole on our backyard. Actually, you can eat the sweet potato leaves. That's one of the, you know, it's one of the things you can like buy in Chinatown, one of the greens you can buy there. But sweet potato leaves by themselves are edible. Okay. What do they taste like? I'll be good. <laughs> now, and sweet potato vine is different they're, altogether. They're a little bit, um, a little bit slimy. Not, not terribly slimy, but a little bit. I'm actually going to show how, how green I am to this. I inherited a bunch of seeds from somebody who said, well, I don't really know if these are even good anymore. You know, if you want to give them a go, go ahead. And some of them had 2013 on them and so I've just been like you know a bunch of my stuff was killed in the last frost actually all of it um so I was like you know hey what the heck I got all these extra seeds and I just jammed them in the ground I, does anybody really have any success with super old seeds no. No. usually oh. not <laughs> and you have to you have to place them lovingly in the ground not jam them in the ground come on young lady <laughs> uh, yeah. I went wrong I'll just feed them to the compost heap. I know, I'd say seed viability t totally depends on what you're trying to grow. Uh, corn and onions are the least viable, uh, one to two years, but uh, some are up to seven to ten, uh, especially with more hardy and perennial seeds. Uh, the longer they live for, the longer their seed is usually viable for. Uh, there's a bunch of lists online that, and um, yeah, there are kind of charts that will tell you based on what family of plant it is, how long the viability is for. And pretty much every commercial seed packet will have a use by date on it. That was um, like year one for that, that was intended to be used by. The other something else just to piggyback on that is depending on, uh, I like how Chad said, you should have placed them lovingly and not jam them. But depending what you put in the ground, some some things like peppers they want a really warm soil you know so it's not going to happen if you just put them in and the soil temperature has been what we're at for a lot of things so you might be a little early with that so it's going to be hard to tell if it's the seed being viable or some of the conditions mixed in with that as well i have a question what is considered warm enough temperature i just invested in a thermometer to test my soil temperature I mean, is 60 too cold for tomatoes and peppers? Yes. It is. You can go online and there are charts. If you go to the big growers, um, they'll have charts and they'll show you what the temperature, ground temperature should be for different types of plants. Uh -huh. 
which if you've been doing this a long time, you just sort of, there's dates you kind of know. But I think if you're newer and you bought the thermometer, I would, you know, get one of those charts and use that. Uh, your tomato seeds like now are not going to germinate in the ground. No, I think tomatoes because I'm, I guess I'm crossing the spectrum of newbie to the experience. Tomatoes want to be like 70 yeah. minimum. Oh, at least. For the soil. Yeah. So oh, super early. Sorry. I have a jumping bean. <laughs> the plants or the seeds? Sorry. The seeds. The seeds. And what about seeds. plants? I started plants indoors. <laughs> Nice. Do, do okay at seven do okay with right now there's plenty of people that have tomatoes in the garden um, this, you know they just can't hit the frost the frost won't work for them but I, hopefully we're past all of that so the plants you can put in um michael should we uh do our shimmy at this point right yeah yeah folks we've been sitting down for 45 minutes we're about halfway through you know, everyone knows sitting too long is not good. It's not good. So get up. time to get up, do your shimmy in place. As much as you're sick of shuffling your place, do your shimmy in place. Uh, if you need a bathroom break, now's the time. And we'll come back for a couple of announcements and get on to the second half. So we are planning on talking about fruiting trees, right? Yep. Yep, that's the presentation on the second half. Oh, I didn't realize, it, I thought it was just questions. That's great. Q&A first half and then the shimmy and then a few announcements and then the presentation. That's the order. Too tired to do anything. All right, now we're all wide awake. So here's one announcement that we had sent in. Don't know if this is of interest to anybody. May 20th. Hmm. They're actually, I went to a, a program from them last year um, and it was really cool because they had master gardeners on site and you could ask them any question you want. And even if they didn't know the answer, they sent you the message in the mail. And you opened it up and it was like a little gift. Like, here's your answer. It was awesome. Michael, right. is there a way to make your screen smaller? Because it's getting cut off on the bottom. Um, oh. I don't know if anybody else has that experience. Huh. Let's see. Ma'am, you can just minimize the image and uh, with the minus sign. and it will come back uh, and you can see the bottom. Are you talking about me? No, uh, to Peyton, when, when, when you have the screen share up, you can just minimize the image of the person who's talking. No, I, I mean actually, so I'm in full screen and his the screen that oh. Paul was sharing was full screen on my computer, but it seems like the there was like some days of the week that were listed and it was cut off from there below. Can you see all of this, Peyton? Can you see the yes. bottom line? Yes, yeah. I had the same problem as Peyton did, so. Can you see the bottom line? It says garden surplus campaign contributions? Yes. Okay, that's all that's on the bottom of this one. So we have a few announcements. Tomorrow night, um, we're gonna have a, a discussion of the movie Dirt, and you can watch it for free on that website, on what Netflix or filmsforaction.org, you can watch it for free. It's a pretty good movie about dirt. Uh, you need to sign up through the library, or if you don't, 
if you haven't had time to do that, just email uh, Sustainable War with Five or Chad at uh, Grow Local Greenwood Lake, and we can tell, send you the Zoom information. Watch the movie ahead of time. Be ready to discuss it at seven. That's that's the way we're doing it. Oh, Sustainable Warwick. Uh, we'll be having our general meeting on Wednesday, and uh, you know we're the ones who are sponsoring the the this along with Grow Local Greenwood Lake, and we have a lot of good things going on, especially related to gardening. One I'm going to get to later uh, in the announcements. Um, let's see. For a future session, if you have any interesting weeds. <laughs> Please take pictures of them, send them in. Now, what qualifies as an interesting weed? It's something that you don't know what it is or, or something that you think, oh, this is actually, it tastes good, it's edible, uh, that people should be foraging for and keeping, or you know, something that you think, oh gosh, if I'd known this, I would have taken, nipped it in the bud before it took over my yard. I hope it doesn't happen to anybody else. Anything like, you know, that you have a little insight for other gardeners, please, you know, if you have any weeds like that, let us all know. Take pictures and send them in. I don't know which week we'll do this, maybe two or three weeks down the road, whenever. Then Can anybody else consider a hosta a weed? <laughs> you can actually eat hostas, do you know that? I read yeah. that. You can actually eat them. Yeah, when they come out. out of control. I can, last year I tried pulling them all out and they just keep coming back. I Have plant them on purpose. <laughs> You can have all of my hostas, Sarah. Come on by. Free hostas for everybody. Have you thought about putting them out where the deer can eat them? They're out where the deer can eat them. Wow. Wow. That's a Ours, Yeah. So there's something that, uh, that Sustainable Warwick is thinking. I know a couple of people on, um, from our garden group, at least a couple from the group, uh, contributed to the uh, food pantry uh, donation campaign and that was very successful and we thank everyone for doing that it was really it was a good experience we're all happy with that this is something we're thinking about doing next somebody asked a question she's about food pantry she said you know every year something happens and i've got like more spaghetti squash than i know what to do with or the other year it'll be more string beans than i know what to do with it is this a good thing to give to a food pantry and the answer is it's not really easy for the food pantry to deal with those things. They'll take it, they'll be very grateful, but then where are they gonna store it? You, you provide them enough for 10 families, but they actually have 60 families to provide for. And so we're thinking about doing this instead. What if we sort of got together this program so people knew this was gonna happen? You put a table at the end of your driveway saying, if your family needs extra food, take this. Or if you'd like to pay for this, we'll. Donate your money to the food pantries. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I'm, I'm curious for, for feedback about how, the, how people feel about this campaign. Would they like to participate or uh, is there something that they foresee? I, I know Lori and Tom there are, this is, their, this is their dream come true. How are they gonna get rid of all that garlic? <laughs> and the is there, this is their dream come true. There um, are some communities that do uh, I think it's called, is it You Pick Project, where they actually plant, uh, people volunteer to plant um, at the edge of their property, a garden, and they put it out to the community that anyone who wants fresh vegetables or who needs food can come and just pick anything that's in front of their homes. I think they've done it in, I want to say Nyack and some other uh, communities in the area. Wow. Yeah, no, I like it. Yeah. That's hard with our with our gardens because of the deer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'd have to have it fenced in. So, I like the idea of just putting out a table and saying, you know, free vegetables or or if you want to donate, you know, we'll give it to the food pantry. I think that's a great idea. How is this different from what Chad was talking about earlier about having a central location with a table, or did I completely misunderstand that? Oh, this was something I hadn't mentioned to Chad before. <laughs> so it's sort of two things up in the air at the same time. We think, ahead, we, think, we think two great, great minds think alike. This my only concern I've, is... I'm, I'm sorry, this is something I've been trying to do on my farm for a while now. Uh, to I, I end up with produce and I'm looking to give it away. And I'd like it to go to communities in need and I... Uh, I've thought about putting out a free farm stand where I live, but 
I, I'd really have it rather have it to go to, to more of the communities that need this thing. Uh, unfortunately, is isn't around Warwick. In Ulster County, they have programs. Uh, I think it's called the Food Recovery Project or the the Gleaning Project. I think yes, maybe in Orange County that goes around farms you know, where they don't have the uh, labor required to do proper harvesting and get fresh food from the farms to the people that need it. So they rely on volunteers to help process fresh food and make it available for communities that uh, that do need that kind of resources. So um, possibly connecting uh, our, our local groups with some some groups like that that can handle the fresh produce when it, when it coming around in season might might be good. Um, uh, Ber Brendan, uh, there there is a um, a program through Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, there's a fruit a food security program uh, whose coordinator is uh, Styles Najak. Are you aware of that? Styles. Uh, no, I'm not. I'd, I'd like to hear more, though. Okay, I think I can get you her information. That's all I have. Going Thank back you. to what Michael was saying, I'm totally interested. I think that that's a great idea. Um, and even if it was something where people were coming to take food and we did leave out jars or something asking for a donation that then went back to the food pantry, I think that that would be a solution to help it go full circle. Even though I do, I love the idea of trying to give the fresh produce to the food pantry, but I understand some of the issues with that. And they, an, a question with that is they won't take prepared foods, will they, from us? Not if it if it hasn't been made in a commercial kitchen, then no. Because I'm thinking about those times where like it's zucchini season and you know everybody's just giving away zucchini like it's going out of style. We could be <laughs> making so many different dishes to share for that. Yeah, like you know, I live right by the Greenwood Lake uh, Food Pantry. They're they're very receptive to uh, taking produce, and they say again, I don't know. Hopefully, it gets used, but. They are into uh, doing it. I don't know how the other food pantries are, but I know in Michael, yeah, it could be tricky as well. When you have a bunch of tomatoes, like how do you how do you separate that up and whatever whatever's left over? But it really could be thing around here. That when um, it's also you know, there's so much stuff that really doesn't get picked, like uh, something that doesn't maybe look perfect. All these lettuce. If someone could come and you know gather all that and yeah. Um, yeah. take yeah. that, you know, that's yes. Uh, yeah, there is somebody that gathers all that in um, Orange County. I just found the page at Cornell Cooperative Extension. I sent the link out in the in the the chat. They have a uh, refrigerator box truck they come and pick up, and then they distribute to uh, food pantries, soup kitchens, mm -hmm. etc. The Hudson Valley Food Bank, so on. That's well, that's fantastic. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. All, all of the all of the um, food pantries that we donated to, all five of them participate in the. In, in that network. So they're, they're all work with the Hudson Valley, the food bank of the Hudson Valley. So it wouldn't necessarily go to people in Warwick, but it would go to people who need it, who are local, relatively local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what the paint, when I was talking about earlier was, uh, again, you know, more, uh, a more a spot where people could exchange vegetables with each other or excess stuff. You know, I guess it would also be volunteer run, you know, people would come on, Thursday from six to eight or, you know, Friday. And, uh, you know, just to see how that goes. And then I was thinking, right, taking the excess, you know, just bring it over to my, or maybe even setting up a table, you know, next to my food pantry. Cause again, I'm very close to them. So, you know, maybe take the headache out of their hands and just have some baskets when have people take stuff, but I would have to ask them first, but, you know, I guess it's, you know, me and Michael talking similar things, but a little different. I like the idea of the gleaning, uh, if that's what it's called, the gleaning thing, as opposed to putting it out at the end of your driveway, because people take more than they need more often than not. Yeah, and, and gleaning could really, you could, you could get, a ton, especially with all the farms we have around here, you could, if you had enough volunteers, you could come back with, you know, bushels and bushels of, of you know very usable stuff that just doesn't get you know harvested yep. at the right exact time. Yeah, it becomes misfit fruit and vegetables that they think that they can't sell. 
Before right, you know, the carrot's a little twisted, so, you know, God forbid. Okay, so I'm glad we've got these ideas on the table and a lot of people are contributing. Usually we take this time to go, uh, what's happening this week currently, um, but, you know, we have Jack's presentation and we're, we're running a little bit late on time. So, uh, Garrett, was there anything particular you really want to jump in and say or do you want to do next week instead? Would that work? Um, I could do either or. I'll just say that uh, today Swiss chard went into the ground, you know. Okay. The map is here. I got my map. <laughs> map it out. I'd be really interested in seeing that map. I'm laying everything out right now, and I'm like, <laughs> it's a stressful time mapping it all. Well, right, so we go right to the. Map. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll send you a text, Nick. Okay. Why don't Why don't we uh, turn the floor over to Jack now? And, and, and let him go ahead with his presentation on fruit trees. And um, let's see, this, little bit, this is fun, because Ginny and Jack, of course, are in the same house. A little bit looks like they're in a Harry Potter, you know, where they're stepping one, from one painting into the other here. I, I like that. Um, and we do have several questions on trees in case, uh, in, in, if, if there's time for that, or maybe they can wait till next week. Hey there. Uh, so with fruit trees, you know, I'll just start, you know, from the very beginning, uh, you know, you buy your trees from, you know, wherever you go, whether it's, you know, your local nursery, uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, they all, you know, have, you know, fruit trees now. You pick up your trees, you bring them home. Uh, the first thing, you know, you want to pick a good spot where you know, minimum, you know, they, they really want a lot of sun, you know, minimum, I'm going to say, you know, eight plus hours a day of, you know, full sunlight. Uh, depending how many trees, you, you know, you're thinking of planting, uh, you know, you want to space them out, you know, minimum. And, you know, I really blew it on this, you know, you, you want, you know, I'm going to say, you know, 12 feet minimum between trees. And when you bring a tree home in a, a three gallon bucket, you know, you're looking at it and your next tree is 12 feet apart and the tree's only five feet tall. You're like, you know, it really looks, looks tiny, but you know, in five or six years, that tree, you know, the branches are going to be touching each other. And, you know, I blew it on a couple of trees, you know, planting them closer where they were going to look, you know, more presentable and, you know, where I have them all fenced in. So, you know, spacing them out, uh, sunlight, uh, slope for drainage or flat ground, depending, you know, either one would work. Uh, so when you have, you know, your area picked out, you have your trees, you know, you got to dig a hole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the things I do, I got from my father and some, you know, they say isn't, you know, people don't necessarily do some of the things now that I'll tell you, but, you know, it's just the way I grew up doing some of the things. So it's, you know, I still do it, even if it's right or wrong. And normally, you know, if I, when I get a tree, I'll dig the hole twice the size of the uh, pot that it came in, the width, and I'll dig it, you know, maybe half deeper than the, you know, the depth of the pot. And, you know, people now say, you know, you dig the hole a little bit wider than the pot, but, you know, I go twice the width of the pot. Just, you know, that's what I do. And, you know, I'm not, I don't know. I guess, you know, I could change, but at this point gonna happen right away uh, so you know I dig a hole I put the, the soil I dig out I put it to the side and usually you know I have a couple of wheelbarrows I'll put you know the soil I take out into a wheelbarrow I get the rocks out of it and that goes in another pile and when I have the hole you know dug out to the you know the depth that I want I'll fill the hole to the top with water and I'll let it drain out and that'll tell me you know whether it's you know good drainage or poor drainage and that's a whole nother issue you know, let the water drain out. And so then I'll take the soil that I dug out and I'll mix it with good topsoil. Where we are, the, the soil, you know, sections of the property uh, is, you know, a lot of it is like almost like pea gravel where the water will drain right out. And there's other sections where it's really hard clay and shale where I've dug a hole and the water has stayed in the hole for two days. And I've had to trench it out to daylight and put gravel in it just to, you know, get rid of the water in the hole, you know, for bushes and whatnot. 
so I dig the hole, the soil, I move off to the side. I'll mix, I'll mix it with, you know, good topsoil, whether it's, you know, a mix of, uh, you know, soil for, you know, trees and shrubs, and I'll throw in, uh, you know, cow bagged cow manures. So, you know, less chance of, you know, weeds and whatnot. And I'll do, you know, whether, you know, it might be like, you know, a 50 50 mix of, you know, the original soil and my new, new soil where it's going to have more nutrients for the tree. And I'll put in enough soil where the bottom of the root ball will just be a little bit above grade and I'll pack it down, you know, to make sure that the tree, the top of the root ball will still be above grade somewhat. And I'll, and I'll make sure the root ball, you know, isn't bound up. And usually I found that a lot of the trees, you know, they've been placed in the pots, you know, you know, if you bought them, you know, a month ago, they were probably put into a pot either, you know, this year or, or a year ago. So, you know, I haven't really found it, have, haven't gotten a fruit tree that the roots are really bound up. And if they are bound, then I just take my fingers and, you know, push them through and try and break up the roots and the soil and whatnot. And I'll put them into the ground and I'll take my mixed soil and I'll fill it in around the root ball. And as I put it in, I'll take my fist and I'll pack the soil in around the tree. And that'll help, you know, uh, get rid of the air pockets in the soil. And I'll just, you know, keep doing that until it, you know, I'm right up to about grade. And I'll bring the soil up a little bit above grade to where the tree, you know, the original root line, the original soil line around the top of the tree uh, is. And I'll bring the soil just a little bit above that because there will be settling once you start watering it. And so, you know, digging the hole, filling with water, draining it, putting the root ball in, making sure it's not root bound, uh, putting new soil in, packing it down, you know, getting rid of the air pockets. And that helps also, you know, so there's less chance of uh, root rot and disease inside the, you know, in the ground. Uh, so then after that, you know, also what you want to do is when you water the tree, you want to water it, you know, gradually. So the water has a chance to, you know, soak the, the new soil with the root ball and it'll help, you know, kind of tighten it all up. So it'll all be, you know, one, one unit, I don't know. Uh, and it will just kind of like, you know, sink together, whether it drops down and shrinks, you might have to put more of the soil on top, depending how much settling you have uh, with the tree. You know, that's normally what I go through in planting a tree. And then there's a whole nother thing, you know, staking the tree, not staking the tree. Uh, you know, someone was talking last week, you know, with their plants, like they're always, you know, brushing them or they have a fan going on to make them tougher. And you see trees where they'll have, you know, three uh, poles in the ground to brace the tree. But they, you know, some people, I mean, a lot of, you know, places do it. You see landscapers doing it, uh, road departments do it. But then you read that they say that's not really good because it doesn't help the tree get stronger, you know, from the roots, you know, to give it strength. And now, I mean, a lot of the uh, apple orchards and whatnot, they'll take a, uh, you know, like a three quarter inch conduit and they'll drive that into the ground and tie the tree off to the conduit, you know, to help brace the tree. And I've tried, I started doing that with some of my trees. And, you know, the one good thing about that is that it helps the tree, you know, to grow straighter where, you know, it's not going to be leaning toward, you know, toward, you know, the south, you know, to get the sun. And I have some trees that, you know, I didn't do the, uh, the bracing and, you know, and they're, you know, really leaning, you know, to the south. And the ones that, you know, I have braced, you know, they are growing straight. So, you know, in a way, I guess, you know, it is working. And, you know, you see a lot of the farmers that are doing that. And so I'll take the, you know, three quarter inch conduit and I'll take the bottom of it and I'll take a sledgehammer and I'll, I'll flatten the bottom out. So I'll just make it easier to drive into the ground. And I'll try and go, uh, you know, at least, you know, a foot deeper than the hole. So at least, 
you know, if you just went to the bottom of the hole that you just dug, there's not really going to be any stability. It's just going to be all, you know, fresh soil and the pole is just going to bend over with the tree. So you want to get through the hole that you dug and then go another, you know, whether another foot or so into solid ground where, you know, it's going to have some stability for the tree. And then, you know, once you do that, uh, you know, it can take, uh, you know, some kind of twine and then tie the tree to the, uh, to the pole, you know, to, you know, to keep it in line with the pole, you know, you, you will have to keep that somewhat loose because as the tree grows, you know, it's, you know, you, again, I've seen some where the, you know, I didn't adjust the twine and it's now, you know, embedded into the bark and whatnot and I have to cut it and retie it, you know, to keep it growing straight. Uh, you know, that's just some of the things I've been doing. If anyone wants to throw in any, uh, Tidbits, you know, by all means, you know, jump in. Questions. If you have any questions or anything you want to add, by all means, uh, you know, let me know what you think, you know, whether I'm doing something right or wrong, uh, open to suggestions. Uh, another thing, you know, with the fruit trees, you know, again, what, you know, with the vegetable garden is uh, fencing. And, you know, I have a, a section that's probably uh, you know, 40 by a hundred or hundred forty by a hundred feet or more. And I have eight foot deer fencing around it. And I try and reuse what, you know, I have or what I get off jobs. And, you know, from doing something years ago, I ended up with, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, T posts, which are used for fencing, but they're only like five feet tall. So then I took, uh, pressure treated two by twos and I just used bailing wire to attach them to the T posts. And then I used my eight foot deer fencing and went around the whole perimeter with the eight foot deer fencing. And then I had a problem, you know, years ago with, uh, you know, squirrels and groundhogs and stuff getting under it. So then I took uh, chicken wire and I folded it, you know, going out. I wasn't going to trench all the way around, put it underground going out a foot. I just put it right on top, folded it out 90 degrees. Uh, I just had the grass grow up through it, and that kind of made it strong enough where, you know, I did the one half of the, uh, where my fruit trees are that was along the, you know, facing the wood line, because that's where most of the animals were coming from, was from the wood line. And that, you know, is where I had, you know, majority of the uh, chicken wire, and it's held up, except, I mean, you know, between the mower and the string trimmer and stuff, you know, it gets, you know, that, you know it's maintenance, but you know, at least, you know, it's keeping majority of the animals out. Um, you know, I've tried have a hard traps for the woodchucks and then, you know, you run into, you know, relocating them and that's a whole nother, you know, another story, you know, for another time. And there's other, you know, means that you can do to, you know, eradicate them, but that's not for tonight. Uh, Jack, can you, yep. can you answer this question that somebody asked? Well, what fruit trees grow here? What, what, what particular kinds are, are especially good for this county? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, there's a whole you know range of apples that you know are good for here. Peaches. Um, I started growing peaches, you know, four, you know, uh, more than four or five years ago. Uh, some are doing great. Some. Not, I mean, there's a lot, you know, there, again, like, you know, peaches and apples, there's a lot of different varieties. So, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. And, you know, then the pollination, you know, there are trees that will you know, cross pollinate, you know, so that'll help with the pollination. Uh, I've tried, uh, I have pear trees, you know, there's uh, Bartlett's, I have a Bartlett. Um, I can't think cherry of them trees. off the top of my head right now. I have uh, a couple of cherry trees. You know, the one thing with cherry trees is, you know, they grow really, they, they grow tall and then it's really hard to get the cherries. You know, it's like I'm growing cherry trees for the birds basically and squirrels and they're kind of outside the fencing just because you know, they get so tall and then I can't get to the cherries and it's, 
you know, it's for the animals, basically, is the, what, you know, I've been doing Quince, for the right. cherries. Yeah. Uh, we had quince. They worked really well for, uh, they were, the people we bought the house from, they had, it was originally an old apple orchard where most of the original apple trees had, you know, been taken down. And then the people who first built the house, they planted some fruit trees. We had a quince that probably lasted you know, about 30 years, but we never really did anything with the quince. We had a few friends that would come and I would, you know, collect the quince and give them, you know, bags of the quince to make the mint jelly. Uh, I have, you know, a whole bunch of uh, wild raspberry bushes that, you know, I've transplanted over the years into, you know, a section. I try and keep everything in, in tight areas that, you know, to make it easy to fence in. And, you know, originally we had fruit trees scattered all over our property. We have 10 acres, but it's not all uh, fruit trees. You know, we have, you know, woods and other things going on. But, uh, and, you know, when we first moved there 25 years ago, a friend came over who was, you know, into the horticulture. He said, you know, really want to try and keep everything close together so you're not going all over the property. You know, like one tree, you know, here then another tree you know 300 feet away another tree somewhere else you want to try and you know keep everything consolidated into one area it just makes it easier for working on the trees and you know in our case for you know helping keeping everything fenced in and you go on our property i do have some single trees where i'll have you know the deer netting you know around the trees you know single trees uh plus i have you know the larger area that's all fenced in so it's kind of a you know, a mix where, you know, things are consolidated and things aren't. And, you know, again, with the posts I've used, I get a lot of uh, aluminum speed rail, which is like a, a inch and three quarter aluminum pipe, you know, that we use that work a lot and we go through tons of it. And if I have, you know, 10 foot sections, you know, I'll, I'll take it from work and I'll use the aluminum pipe and drive that into the ground and use it, you know, as fence posts. You know, at least I'll get, you know, so I'll have, you know, eight feet with two feet into the ground. I, I can pretty much drive anything in about 18 inches and then it just stops. Even around our vegetable garden, you know, using four by fours, I get about 18 inches and then that's it. It's just like, you know, there's just a layer of shale all through our property and, you know, it's just tough to get through. Other than, you know, getting a postal digger for, you know, four by fours, which you know, I'm cheap and I just like to try and do as much as I can by myself without, you know, bringing equipment in. Um, so uh, mulberry trees, I have no idea where to get a mulberry tree. Uh, I, I sent them to, to uh, Barbara at Midsummer Farm sells mulberry trees, if anyone okay. fact wants one. Does anybody know around town where they can find a mulberry tree? In my yard come and dig them up and take them. I had an arborist come a couple of weeks ago and um, he started pointing out how many mulberry trees I have. And I was like, wow, it's kind of a weed of a tree, isn't it? And he was like, exactly, it's a weed of a tree. So I have two that are leaning into my yard that I could actually like pull fruit off of. And then there's a ton sort of under a bunch of pine trees on my property. I don't know how easy they are to dig up, but. I just want to tell you this, after, if you take the leaves of those trees after they've frosted and you shampoo your hair with them, they make your hair silk-like. You might call that a weed, other people might call it something different. Yeah. <laughs> that has some other recipes for, for mulberry leaves, but they're, you know, that's what the silkworms eat and uh, they're, they're, there's some advantages to those leaves. And if the berries are good, what I've learned about mulberries is um, there's so many different varieties, but it really depends on the individual tree for how tasty the berry is going to be. We've got one growing wild in our backyard that's that the mulberries are tasteless. We still like to bring them in a few, but we planted a couple. They're a little bit struggling now, but the, the flavor was great. We've got a couple other questions here. What's this is a question for me. Actually, Jack, you visited here once. You told me the answer, but I think it was too complicated for me to remember. I've got this huge tree that's like starting to grow through the fence. Should I be like trimming that tree every year or should I just give up on the fence or what are my options here? 
Uh, well, with the evergreens, uh, you know, I've been planting Christmas trees. Uh, probably about four or five years ago, I started planting Christmas trees. And I think what's going to happen with the Christmas trees is that I'm really planting them for the next people to buy our house, and they'll be the ones that will be selling them or doing something with them. But, um, you know, you, I do shape them in the spring after, you know, like now you can see the new growth on them, and I'll wait probably uh, another four weeks or so, and I'll take a hedge trimmer, and I'll start shaping the tree, you know, to give it, you know, shape. And, you know, looking at that tree, uh, you know, you have choices, you know, you shape it, but you got to make sure you, you only want to take off, you know, the new growth, you know, that comes. So is that picture this year or is it last year? This year. Okay. So yeah, you should be seeing new growth on it. And the new growth, you know, I'm going to say maybe take, you know, half the new growth off the tree. You don't want to go pat, you don't want to take off all the new growth because I think, you know, they say that, you know, with evergreens, like I can see where my mower has like gotten too close to the, the trunk of the trees, you know, they're not, they're not producing new growth. So you have to be careful, you know, where you draw the line on trimming the tree, other than, you know, moving the fence back, you know, around the tree uh and trimming it right up to it and just you know see what happens you might have a you know you might end up with a bare spot you know if you trim too heavily you know along the fence but you're gonna have to you know do something either uh you know live with the tree coming through the fence or you know cutting it back and you know, dealing with the bare spot or moving the fence, I don't know. Or, you know, cutting it down and starting over again with a new tree further away from the fence. Yeah, does anyone else have an opinion on this topic? Uh, you, can, you can cut the bottom branches off of a tree. I can't see how tall the tree is, but you can cut the bottom branches off of the tree and you will just have a, you know, a, a trunk and then the branches will start up further. I've seen people do that to those trees. Um, that would take care of the part coming through the fence, but it depends on how big the tree is. I can't really see how big the tree is. Right. Um, I guess this is a six foot fence here and I'm guessing it's maybe 12 feet tall. Yeah, they were pretty tall. Okay. All right. So I, I think, you know, I, you don't want to take off half the branches, obviously, but yeah. you could, you could, you could do it gradually. You could start by cutting off what's what's coming through the fence. Are you worried about it's going to damage the fence? Is that the idea? Yeah, over time is. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, especially if you get snow on it or something. Well, I would say cut cut back some of that you know that's coming through the fence, and then maybe do it again next year, and then eventually just start cutting the um, the, the lower branches, and that would work, I think. Hmm. Okay. If you make Christmas decorations, I go around and, you know, trim off parts of trees to make Christmas decorations. And in the winter, I won't take off a whole section, but you could thin it out since you're, you want to leave the tree and leave the fence. Mm -hmm. Probably people who would take greens from you uh, for decorations, or you can just take them over to the, the uh, recycling the winter recycling. Great idea, Sarah. I'm definitely in for some of those scraps for decorating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? I'm, I, ran, I go around getting them from everybody. <laughs> They're expensive. They're so expensive. And I see people hang them like on their front porches. And I'm like, I love that idea. So yeah, um, yeah. I'll take So when do you two want to come over? I mean, the holidays are a little <laughs> away, but uh, we can, I can. We'll, November ish, we'll be over. Yeah. Safe social distancing, you know, cutting the six feet. Right. Okay, let's get on to the next another question. And again, this is one for me. These are plum trees. Jack, you see this stuff right in here? Oh, that's disease. You got to cut it out and get rid of it. Yeah? Yep. What if, like, a lot of branches, so many branches, I mean, I'm not leaving much of the tree if I take too many with it, have like that. Yeah. Uh... 
You know, I just remember, you know, I had some trees that had that on it. And I just remember when uh, Bill was, you know, in charge of the fruit trees at the community garden, you know, he just said, you know, you got to get rid of that stuff. You know, especially, uh, you know, the spring and summer, it'll, it'll get real sappy. And uh, yeah, it's just, you, you got to get rid of it because it's, it's gonna, it's disease and it can spread to other branches and as much as you're gonna hate doing it, you know, okay. you gotta lock it off below the below where you where you know the joint is. Okay. Anybody Good else mind. have comments on that? I'm sorry. Does anyone else have comments on that uh, picture? Sure. And maybe you could spray it with like a copper spray uh, to cut it just to hopefully head off any stuff. But yeah, if, if it not a lot of the tree is, you know, you might be in a rush, but you definitely should cut that. Is okay. this leaf curl that you're... Oh my, sorry about my echo. Um, this is Melanie. Is that leaf curl? Is that what that is? What is that called? No, it's black. Kind of black. No, it's not leaf curl. Uh, yeah, no, it's like a black thing that grows on the branch. I, I forgot that. I know the name of it. I'm blanking. Yeah, the tree might have had a wound, you know, and it's just, you know, it, you know, it's infected. I, I don't know what the actual. So my excuse is, is that in our yard, it's like we have. And especially when they dug the deer fence, you could see this. On one end of the side of the yard, you have like this much soil, and then the then the rock begins. And then as you get across the yard, you get down to maybe three or four feet of soil. But it seemed felt like, especially when it rained, that 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 any trees we had just drowned. That you know that the it was just too wet, you know, for them to survive. And so maybe this tree is just really challenged. But then again, you were just saying that you're in your own yard. You you go down 18 inches and you get to rock. Um, I have another picture. It's not here tonight, but it's basically it looks like this maple tree is growing out of like rock. And you wonder where do those roots go? The roots are going to search for water, and you know they're going to go wherever they can, you know, to find moisture in the soil you know, whether they wrap around a rock or, you know, another tree. I think, I, was that the tree we saw in the beginning that didn't have any leaves on it? No, this is another one. This okay. one, um, is this actually a mulberry? It has great berries. Um, and it had leaves before it was really cold and then it got really cold. And, and it, this has some other things going on, I think. We had two of these and one of them like, really started falling apart, but, it had leaves before the cold this year. How do you think this tree is going to come out? Well, one thing you can do is uh, cut a branch and see if it's still green under the bark. Okay. And that'll tell you whether or not, you know, if it's, if it's green, you know, even if you just scrape the bark with your fingernail on a branch, and if it's green, then, you know, you know it's still, you know, sucking up water from the ground. And, you know, wait till next year and see what happens. Okay. You know, I have some trees, bare root trees, and that's a whole nother discussion I could get into if you want. But uh, again, with planting, you know, fruit trees, you know, for the, you know, minimum in the first three years, you really have to, you know, keep on top with, you know, the watering. And, you know, I blew it on a couple of trees and, you know, it was very unfortunate. It really killed me that, you know, I lost, you know, three bare root peach trees that, you know, we're starting to branch out and, the, you know, they were really looking great last spring and, and I blew it, not watering them, you know, during one of the really dry times. And I think I lost, you know, all three. So, you know, I don't fertilize the first year. I'll start, you know, fertilizing the second year. And I used to get these organic uh, tablets from the Sullivan County uh, Tree and Shrub. In the spring, they would do, uh, you can buy Christmas trees, fruit, bare root, uh, fruit trees, blueberries, all, you know, they have a whole variety of, you know, trees you can buy. And I used to get the uh, fertilizer tablets, you know, through them. 
for the fruit trees and Christmas trees. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, just I wanted to, uh, Arnold had a question about a pear tree not producing pears anymore. I just wanted to get that in before we, uh, people start uh, heading out. If you could yeah. have any idea why that might happen. Yeah, thank you, Chad. So, so Jack, about uh, 20 years ago, I bought some two pear trees on sale, a Bosch and a Bartlett. I don't know which one is which anymore. I'm sure I could find out. Uh, Michael, could I share a picture here? If you if you can, sure, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. It did? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, just a second. Uh, and I'm just going to flash these pictures on, and you know me well enough to trust me. <laughs> All right. Um, it's actually not, it doesn't, I don't see the option to do that. Let's see. Let me try something else. Okay. Well, we'll just wait a little bit longer and then I'll just continue and we can figure out off, offline. Or maybe, Jack, you know, Jack, if you have any ideas you can, about why pairs sometimes stop producing or why they're looking. Well, let me tell you the situation here. The, oh, okay. Uh, so about five years ago, well, four years ago, the, 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 they basically slowed down. Okay. And I remember when I used to have hundreds and hundreds of pairs come to the ground um, and, and the bees would attack them and the bees would get so filled with pear juice that they would be lethargic and not smoke anymore. And I, I grew to be not afraid of bees. And I used to bring the pears to work in baskets uh, for gifts. And I stopped that because of the, 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 the political climate that it created. You know, somebody could have you know, written an MBA thesis on it. So last couple of years, no pears. And I even built one of those, and I wish I could share the picture of this. Uh, Sarah, you might recall this uh, put on by one of um, our garden people on how to build uh, those triangular things with tubes in them to put in trees to create nests for bees. Oh, right, right, bee yeah. houses. Bee houses, so I have a picture of the bee house, which I can't share right now, but Michael, I should have sent you the pictures beforehand. I apologize. Next, next time, um, send them from, we'll show them next time. Yeah, so last year I had three pairs <laughs> on either the Bosch or the Bartlett, I don't know which one, and the trees are thriving, okay? They grow aggressively. I have a whole bin full of, of pear tree twigs, which I save so that I can put them in my smoker because it creates a nice gentle smell uh, smoke for fish and seafood and so on. Um, so there's nothing about the, 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 the intensity of the, of the trees growing up and shooting up, but the flowering season is, is they, they, they bloomed about two weeks ago, but hardly any flowers on them. And, and I think it's because there's no bees, but the bees would be there if there was the flowers. So I'm totally confused. And not that I don't mind because the pears on the ground create a huge mess, uh, which I have to put on rubber gloves and pick up and throw dozens and hundreds of pears in the trash because I can't consume them all. But w w what is happening here? I I I'm just confused. Uh, one thing, uh, maybe you're pruning too heavily. Uh, I prune in um, in the middle of the winter and in in, in uh, February. Yeah, but you could be. I have to show you the pictures. Yeah, you could be taking too much off and losing the buds. Yeah. Okay. And then again, the cross pollination that could be. Well, they're they're that twelve feet away that you mentioned. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Question. Okay. 
is it possible because it was a mild winter that they just didn't I know some fruit trees really need a freeze before they're able to produce, but I always heard that with apples, not pears. Maybe. No, no, one, no one has an idea for uh, Arnold? Sorry. And folks, we are, we are a little past nine o'clock now. Um, oh yeah, sorry. What if we do this? What if we have Arnold send in his pictures and we'll, con we'll continue this question next week after the pictures can be seen? All right, and well, I'll try one more. Is uh, Melanie had one quick question about leaf curl on the peach tree. I don't know if you stole that, Melanie, or. Uh... I am, I am. I would love to Again, hear about thank that. You all, thank you all for attending. If uh, you guys could head out, but. Uh, Want to head out? But not Jack. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, leaf curl on the peach tree. It's had it, I've been here 14 years. It's had it from the very beginning. I've tried the copper spray. Um, mm. The peaches are amazing when they grow. Last year there were like very few of them. Um, this year the snow covered up the tree and I don't know what will happen because I don't see any actual. The buds are there, but uh, I'm not looking good. But in any case, it has the sleeve curl. Um, I you trimmed it last it year. Happens. Huh? You have to spray before you have the issue. Okay. Whether you use, uh, stop. Uh, you, you know, whether you use, uh, you know, the dormant oil and then go into your, you know, your fruit tree spray every, you know, 14 day regimen or whatever. Usually if you have the leaf curl, you're probably too late in treating it. I mean, the peaches still taste good when they come. They taste amazing. You have to cut half of them away, but they taste wonderful um but if there was some way to you're saying i have to do it before it happens but it's, it was there when i moved here so i don't really know what do you mean before it happens like in the winter or something no i mean as you know from when they start budding you know with your spray regimen or, or you know if you're uh using chemicals or organic uh you know you do your dormant oil before the trees start budding and after they bud, then you go into your regular spray routine. What is this oil you're talking about? Because I uh, was told copper oil. spray is the only, I'm sorry? Uh, dormant oil. Dormant oil. I've never heard yeah. of this. What? Yeah, all, the, all the orchards use it. Uh, there's different varieties. Uh, and do you spray the whole tree with it? Spray the whole, you soak it. I mean, because there's no leaves on the tree, so you're soaking the whole tree in dormant oil. It's a mix. It'll be, uh, I have a, a four gallon backpack sprayer and it'll be, you know, I forget now, three ounces per gallon. So I'm using, you know, 12 ounces and four gallons of water. And I go around, you know, spraying all the, all the limbs, you know, underneath on top, all the, you know, the joints with the V's of the branches, you, you know, you just soak everything. And you want to soak it when the buds, you know, before, you know, they start swelling and yeah. opening up. Yeah. Well, this year has been crazy for any Yeah, because it, it was warm in March. Yeah. And then, and, and then it snowed last week. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, actually, about how the apple orchards are doing. Anybody know? Yeah. Oh, well, thank everyone. Yes, I guess, uh, Mike, you want to let people stay on or? Uh... Right. I, I do want to cut off the recording at this point, and if people want to uh, continue talking, you're welcome to do that. But I'm going to am to stop the recording now. Thanks everyone for joining us this week. I got to go. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.